All right, we are going to go ahead and uh, get started. Are we good filming-wise there, Hollywood? All right. Um, <laughs> so it is a joy for me to, to be here, and we are going to do two things today. One, we're welcoming uh, Brian into Sunday school, as well as into the preaching moment and the worship service, as well as uh, his dear wife, Sharon. So we're doing this as a church to welcome a pastor, a beloved friend, the president of Union Seminary. But we're also, we get the gift, or I like to think of it as the gift, this is the last church that Brian and Sharon are going to visit before his retirement on June 30th, correct? So, and he was telling me earlier, we were walking around the sanctuary, that he thinks we were one of the first churches of his tenure back in 2007, so we are a beautiful bookend. Um, so uh, we're delighted to have both of you with us, and because uh, last night at dinner and this morning you said, give you a little bit of time in retirement, and then you can come back and teach more, uh, you can join the men's Bible study on Tuesday mornings, <laughs> um, we wanted to give you all um, some Howard Memorial swag to take with you. Um, and there's, there's a bag, there's two coffee cups, because I don't know if you share well, um, and uh, a devotion, and then some, uh, some pens and pencils for, you said you were going to get and do more writing in your retirement. Um, so oh, nice. we are, uh, we're grateful that you're with us. And uh, the introduction I do want to give this morning, Brian is a retire, soon-to-be-retired seminary professor and president. And the truth of the matter is, seminaries will continue on, as will churches. And so one of the conversations we've had since we've gotten to know each other since 2014-ish, when I uh, came here, and we've had wonderful conversations both as pastor and seminary president, but also just as friends uh, via Zoom and in, in conversation. What does the future of seminary education look like? What has it looked like in the past? Because what happens at Union directly affects what happens at places like Howard Memorial as they train the next generation of pastors. So I wanted to ask Brian what's his viewpoint on that. So I'm going to literally turn it over to him and share what he's noticed over his uh, distinguished career in seminaries and as he looks to the future. Because I'm hoping that he is like John of Patmos and can see into the future, right, like Revelation, and tell us a little bit about it. So we're delighted to have you with you. I'm going to turn it over. I'm not quite like John of Patmos. I don't have the same kind of in with God that uh, he had. So when I look up, I see clouds. I don't see an open door just yet. Maybe the open door is in my future. Um, But I'm delighted to be with uh, you all again. Um, it's always a delight coming to Tarboro to be here at Howard Memorial, and uh, I am, and uh, Ben is right, um, I, one of the things that I've really enjoyed over my time is being able to speak in churches and um, uh, preach in churches and teach in churches, talk about the seminary in churches, which I'll talk about uh, with you all now, um, and uh, it's a delight that um, in my memory, uh, my last official church visit uh, will be Howard Memorial. So that'll be a wonderful memory for Sharon and me to carry with us um, as we go into retirement. And I uh, hope it's going to be a successful retirement where um, I'm not going to be working a whole lot. But um, I'll, I have already told um, Ben and one of, uh, one of you all that um, I, I hear that there is some interest in the book of Revelation. If uh, you want to invite me back to come and talk about that, not at, not at 7.30 or whenever it is on, on, on Wednesday morning. <laughs> But if you want me to come back and talk about that in uh, Bible study on Sundays, um, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so just let me know. Um, I, one of the things I'll be working on will be the book of Revelation and the Gospel of Mark. And I also want to be looking back a little bit at my own ministry. So those are three writing projects I have in mind. But let me talk to you a little bit about uh, the future of theological education. Um, Ben is on the Presbyterian Outlook Board, and uh, they asked me to do a piece on that not too long ago. So I want to share a little bit about um, how I shared in that article, but I also want to give you a sense of a snapshot of where we are right now. When you think about seminaries, uh, I want you to think about the church because they go together. Our focus is primarily to create resources for the church, teaching resources to be sure, um, um, materials for churches to read and to learn from to be sure, but primarily is to create persons who are going to go into leadership in congregations and in church-related activities around the country and around the world. So let me give you a snapshot of how that is looking. Um, People have asked me, well, are people going to seminary these days? Um, The church has many 
things influencing it um, and impacting the church today. The seminaries are likewise being significantly impacted by social issues, uh, cultural issues. Are people going to seminar? Are they being led by God's uh, call into theological education? And the answer is, um, I hope you won't be surprised, yes. Um, Despite the fact that um, it is uh, a challenging call, people are continuing to feel called and committed to um, God's leading um, uh, into ministry. The Association of Theological Schools, which is the accrediting body for all of the theological institutions in North America, the United States, and Canada, lists 260 theological schools. Union Presbyterian Seminary is just one of them, and I just want to crow a little bit. Um, last year we were reaccredited um, for another 10 years to do the work that we are supposed to be doing, and I also like to tell people they didn't ask us to do any homework. They just said, you're doing a good job, keep doing a good job for the next 10 years, and that's kind of exciting for us because most often what happens is that you're asked to do this kind of follow-up, that kind of follow-up. So we feel very good about the fact that uh, the Association of Theological Schools and the other accrediting body that uh, looks at our work, both of them looked at the work the seminary is doing and said, you're doing a good job, keep doing this job, we're finished with you for 10 years. The ATS um, also notes uh, that, uh, well, it looks at individual schools as well as um, the whole collection of schools. It has data on uh, Union Seminary, um, and I want to put our data in relationship to all of those other 260 schools. Uh, We have 23 faculty members, uh, head count. Uh, We also have 208 students. Our tuition is $13,500 a year. That's the cost of uh, um, doing the tuition and fees. Uh, we estimate that it costs somewhere around twenty to thirty thousand dollars for students to go the, each year for three years or two years, however long they're in seminary. Um, the distribution of um, the headcount of um, all of the theological schools in the association is broken down um, in terms of categories. Schools that are less than seventy-five students. That's 24% of all those 260 schools. Schools that are between 75 and 150 students, 29% of the schools. And schools that are 151 to 300 or 25%. And that's where we are. We're in that um, middle range. And then you have a few schools, um, 11% that are 300 to 500. And then um, about 5% of schools have 500 um, to 1,000 students. So most of the schools are about the size that we are in terms of uh, theological education. Uh, We're on the larger end of medium-sized seminaries in terms of the number of students we have. In terms of the uh, degree programs of students in theological schools for the Master of Divinity, which is the degree that I and Ben have when we went to a seminary, there are 6,304 enrolled last year. So that's a pretty big number. Um, so sc- the students are continuing to go. Master of Arts, uh, 7,356, and Doctor of Ministry, 2,505 students enrolled last year. Um, how many theological students are there in all of North America? Not just the ones who enrolled last year, but in terms of Master of Divinity students, there are 29,100. Master of Arts, 27,591. And then Doctor of Ministry, 11,848. And then there are 4,017 PhD students enrolled um, in theological education in uh, North America. You might ask, given everything that's happening in the world and in the church, are people still going to seminary? The answer is, I think, yes. The trends are steady. In 2017, 28,000 were in the MDiv program. 2021, as I just said, 29,000. So the numbers are actually going up. Mostly stable, but kind of going up. 2017, 12,148 people in Master of Arts programs. In 2021, 14,660. The Master of Arts programs is actually growing faster than the MDiv program. These are students who are going to theological schools, not to become ordained in church ministry, but they want to do things like chaplaincy or work for nonprofits, that type of thing. And so they're doing Master of Arts in, um, uh, in professional programs. 
Uh, in terms of the uh, um, demographics of the students in seminary, uh, in 2021, of the 29,100 students, 2,148 were of Asian descent, 4,292 were black, and 1,828 were Hispanic. So um, still small percentages of students of color go into theological schools. If we want to count all the students in theological education, not just in Master of Divinity and Master of Arts and all of those types of things, in every theological school in North America in 2021, there were 78,635. So there's a lot of students going to seminary or going to some theological school. So is God still calling people into theological education? I think the answer is clearly yes. 50,199 of them were men, 63%, 27,879, 35% were women. So still primarily mostly men going into theological education. Um, how many Presbyterians? 78,635. That's how many students in theological schools. How many Presbyterians do you think of those 78,000? You want to take a guess? How many Presbyterians among the 78,000? Five. Five, did you say five? Not 5,000, but five. Oh, okay, okay, 10,000. 30,000. 30,000? See, 5,000, 10,000, 30,000. 1,409. Isn't that interesting? 78,635. How many Presbyterians are enrolled in theological schools? 1,409. 626 MDiv, 216 MA, 567 other degree programs. I kept looking at that myself. Well, I'm reading that wrong. Um, but it's an interesting um, dynamic. You think of the, we have nine theological schools. Um, and many of those schools, like Union, Union, 48% of those students are not Presbyterian. At the largest of our Presbyterian seminaries, Princeton, only about 25% are Presbyterian. So there's a significant shift taking place. So what we want to do is to figure out how we can nurture more Presbyterians to go into theological education. What I didn't look at was uh, how many Presbyterian churches in the PCUSA are looking for clergy. So I don't know that number. What I do know is that I get a lot of mail from or emails from pastors or from pres I mean pastoral nominating committees saying our church is looking for either a pastor or an associate pastor. We've been trying for such and such a period of time. We haven't been able to. Are there people you would like to recommend to us? A couple of them have said we wonder whether there's something wrong with us. We can't find somebody. Um, is there something with us? And I e email back and say, no, it's not, that's not the circumstance. The circumstance is that uh, there are more openings now than there are students graduating, which is an interesting. And when I started, it was exactly the opposite. There were a lot more graduating than there were church positions available for them. So it's an interesting time uh, for uh, the church in that regard. Um, in terms of faculty in the theological schools, 75% of the faculty are white, 25% are racial ethnic, 76% of the faculty in these theological schools, 260 are male, and 24% are female. So that's pretty traditional um, in terms of historical uh, numbers. In terms of, uh, uh, again, um, union, remember we have 208 students. 97% uh, of our full-time students receive financial aid, meaning that uh, most of our students, uh, they don't graduate with debt. The average debt load for students from theological schools is between twenty and thirty thousand dollars. So imagine having thirty thousand dollars of debt, you graduate from seminary and you go into a church position and you have to pay that debt back and the debt from your undergraduate institution. That's a significant load to be carrying with you. So our, one of our goals, pledges at Union, is that we graduate our students without a lot of theological debt. So we have a wonderful uh, um, endowment, but we stretch it um, to um, provide scholarships so that all full-time students receive full tuition and fees at the seminary. Uh, in terms of the breakdown of our students, uh, 16 states, seven countries are represented. The ages range from 22 to 77. 
Um, actually, we had an 82-year-old graduate about five years ago, and she went into ministry in Northern Virginia for about three years before she finally retired. <laughs> Looking at you, doctor. <laughs> uh, people who fail to retire. Um, 75 um, of our students are male, 140 of our students are female, 68% of union students are female. And we have uh, 59, I'm sorry, 39 African American students, so 18%, and then 10 Asians, so 5% Asian. So we are somewhat um, an average in terms of our um, racial ethnic um, breakdown when you compare us with all the 260 schools. However, we, have, uh, we are stronger in terms of the number of women, um, and um, uh, we have, uh, um, I think, uh, about um, an average number of um, non-Presbyterians. In other words, uh, we are as ecumenical as all the other theological schools. So schools are shifting the educational model that they have from content transfer to adaptive learning. That's one thing we think about as we think about the future of education. We found that in innovative seminaries, theological schools, and other institutions forming faith leaders, there's a sea change away from core content transfer model, which, is which assumes that students are clear about what future leaders need to know for effective faith leadership today, to an adaptive learning model, which assumes students need to become agile learners in relationship to real world challenges. So what does that mean? We're moving away from the banking model where a person does what I'm doing with you right now, assuming you don't know anything and I know everything and I'm going to give you everything I know and you just take it in. We do that less and less in theological education now. We talk to students as if they're adult learners. Uh, so we treat most students now the way we have long been treating Ph.D. students. That is, we assume that they are going to be able to gather knowledge and then come and share that knowledge, and then we help them develop that knowledge in the classroom. So instead of me coming up and saying, well, I'm the only one who knows about the Gospel of Mark. You don't know anything about the Gospel of Mark. I'm going to teach you about the Gospel of Mark, and you're going to try to um, memorize as much as you can from me and then go out and regurgitate what you've learned from me. What we do instead is I will do something like post a lecture so it can be used as a podcast so students can listen to it in their cars, they can listen to it while they're walking, they can listen to it while they're running, and then we'll come to classroom time and we'll have conversation. We won't have a lecture necessarily. We'll also um, ask the students to do research on, say, um, the Syrophoenician woman in the Gospel of Mark, and then to come and share the research that they've done with the class, and then we debate about the research that they've, they've gathered. So we're learning together as opposed to me being the only one who is disseminating information. That's a key change in theological education. This move toward adaptive adult learning, flipping our classrooms, treating our students as if they're all doctoral students. So I'm excited about that. I love teaching PhD seminars because the students had as much responsibility as I did as a professor for how the class went. We're doing that with all levels of classes now, and I think that's going to produce some wonderfully engaged um, pastors and uh, associate pastors and church educators who are going out into the churches, and also some wonderful um, Christian educators and chaplains um, and persons who lead nonprofits as well, because they'll be treating others as they've been treated in terms of their mentoring. Schools are also developing new programs to fit a widened sense of vocation to faith leadership. The shifting landscape of prospective student career goals means fewer students are preparing for traditional clergy leadership, while increasing numbers desire formation for faith-rooted leadership in the face of big challenges in the world, from climate change and sustainability to interfaith relations, poverty, and racial justice. As I said, the Master of Arts is becoming the most um, uh, used degree in theological schools, professional master's degrees, so that students can be trained to do things other than pastoral church leadership. So one of our most exciting, and um, well, I shouldn't say most exciting because the MDF remains very exciting, but one of the most um, uh, well-subscribed uh, degree programs by prospective students is the Master of Arts in Public Theology. We announced it about a year ago, and it's just taken off. 
um, because students want to come and learn about public theology because you can use that master's in almost any kind of nonprofit work, and that's where many of our students go. We've also developed uh, things um, like um, uh, centers. We have a center for womanist leadership, a center for global, um, um, uh, uh, the Global Mission Center, uh, the Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation, and a center for Christian education, for excellence in Christian education. We're decentralizing how we build our curriculum so that you don't just come and do, you do come and do church history and um, theology and Bible, but you also connect that uh, with uh, faculty and others who are helping you develop ideas related to things like um, uh, social justice and uh, reconciliation in the world. So these are exciting kinds of changes and shifts that are happening in our school that is mirrored by what's happening in all of the other 260 theological schools in the U.S. Two um, exemplary cases uh, show this shift in emphasis uh, in terms of mission and vision. City Seminary in New York City, a new seminary not yet 15 years old, understands all its educational programs to seek the peace of the city. That's what their strategic vision is, to seek the peace of the city. And so they're educating their students to that end. Fuller Theological Seminary, a long-standing flagship evangelical Protestant seminary, recently shifted its focus from, quote, educating leaders for the church, unquote, to, quote, forming the church for the world, unquote. This is an evangelical seminary, shifting from educating leaders for the church to forming the church for the world. So even evangelical seminaries are beginning to think about how they can broaden the way they're looking at theological education. The um, long-standing um, visionary tagline for union is for the church and the world. So we're trying to do that and have been trying to do that for some time, to think about how we not only equip leaders for the church, but we're equipping these leaders for the church so that they can go out and be transformational in the world and to help the church be a change agent in the world. So in the intervening, in the, in the, I'm sorry, in the 44 years uh, between my entry into seminary as a student and now my pending retirement from theological education as a retiree, a lot has changed in the church and theological education is trying to adapt to that. We've had church schisms, many of them initiated by dramatic shifts in how church folk believe God wants them to respond to changing racial, gender, sexuality, political, and ecological realities in the body politic. And most of us um, know that the Presbyterian Church went through this kind of shift years ago. The United Methodist Church is undergoing this kind of conversation and shift right now. There's church disenfranchisement, a loss of communal status and therefore social station, much of it ignited by the exodus of folk fleeing church even as the number of nuns claiming allegiance to no religious institution skyrockets, and church confusion, a sense of disorientation about how the matter of spiritual nurture can or should engage the world of social and political activism. The church in October um, uh, I'm sorry, the church in, um, in uh, March of 2023 is breaking away from its past and moving fitfully into its future. It's moving from what it was and is to what it will be. And this kind of movement has an impact in the seminary and theological education. Tied as closely as it is to the ministry of the church, given its originating and perpetuating mandate to equip leaders for the church, theological education is unsurprisingly also disoriented. Change in the world is often as frightening as it is fast, either to lead in the midst of this change or even merely to keep up. Change has to come to the church. And if theological education is to maintain its role of equipping church-oriented leaders who can help the church lead or adapt in the world, then it must likewise endure change and fast. So the changes, let me summarize some that are happening um, in theological education. We're changing what we teach. No doubt a core curriculum, as I've said, that prepares students to exegete biblical texts, think theologically, and operate practically will remain a bedrock of the educational experience in theological schools. 
That curriculum is crafted from scholarship, historical, and contemporary. But more and more, we must find ways for the contemporary scholarship that informs theological education to include the diverse voices of diverse peoples and communities from around the globe, particularly those voices whose ideas and writings have traditionally been excluded from the conversations taking place in theological institutions. This has implications in our consideration for who teaches. Theological education must invest more rigorously in efforts to equip students from historically underrepresented communities. At, um, um, uh, in this case, to do so both at the master's levels and at the doctoral levels, because the ones at the doctoral levels then go on to teach the ones at the master's levels. This emphasis will help theological education prepare students and be prepared by professors who look like the church into which these students are going out to serve. This emphasis on the church and the world is important. The students who come to theological education are no longer primarily focused on preparing themselves for church ministry. As I've said, the Master of Divinity degree is no longer the, predominantly, uh, the predominant degree in terms of the fastest growing degree program. Data indicates that the fastest growing degrees in theological education are those two-year professional masters which prepare students for work in nonprofits, NGOs, chaplaincies, social work, and community activism. If theological seminary curricula are to be relevant, we must adjust and adapt. In other words, we have these students coming with these desires. We must figure out ways to build programs to teach them, to equip them to do the kind of work they want to do. To start, we put more emphasis on prophetic witness and public theology, developing curriculum that address the place of theological thinking in the matter of social, political, economic, and ecological life is vital if theological education is going to remain relevant education in this time for the generations of people who have been born and raised in this space. For them, theology is irrelevant if it lacks civic awareness and communal engagement. Even if their primary vocational focus is pastoral church ministry, the theological graduate of today is only relevant for today if they are equipped to speak in, about, to, and for the world. You know, the old joke was when you get together for a family gathering, you don't talk religion and politics, right? But we in theological education are now beginning to realize is that we've got to teach our religious students how to talk politics and how to engage them in a way that reflects how God is moving in the world. And I dare say, given the fracturing in our country today, we need that more now than we have ever needed it. We need theological students who can come out and talk about how the vision of what God is doing in the world has implications for how we gather together as a people, a political people, a body politic. That's a key, key necessary ingredient in what we're doing and what I hope Union is doing very well. Yeah, yeah. We also need to uh, think about where we teach. Residential education remains a strong and viable option, but it must become just that. Most of us went to school and we went and we upended our lives and we moved to the city where the school was and then we did our seminary training as residents. Residential theological education is not the only way and no longer is it the way of doing theological education, but it's one among many alternative approaches to doing theological education. At Union, we're beginning to do what other schools are also beginning to do. We are teaching our students our Charlotte campus, which um, has long been doing theological education on the weekends, where students did most of their work on Saturdays. That is now a program that's a hybrid model, where most of their work is done online, and they come four Saturdays a semester. Even in Richmond, we're beginning to do hybrid-based theological education, even though most of the students are residential. So online and hybrid models are becoming more and more important. As a matter of fact, one of my staff members just recently gave me a chart that listed all the PCUSA seminaries and other seminaries of our size. And we were looking at how many programs are going to either a hybrid or an online format. So many of the students who come out of seminary um, in the next 10 years um, will have either 50 to, I'd say, 70% of their educational coursework 
in some form or another online. It's an interesting time, so we have to figure out how we teach better online. Uh, we need to make radical use of technology in our teaching, and we need to figure out how we can do distance courses and do them well. We also want to change whom we teach. Um, that means we want to make sure that um, we're not just teaching people who want to become ordained, but we're also figuring out how we teach um, people um, like you yourselves. So instead of me teaching about theological education as I'm doing this morning, let's say you wanted to learn more about the Gospel of Mark. But I'm in Richmond and you're here. Uh, we want to use our resources to reach out to figure out how we can teach the Gospel of Mark to you. So one of the things we've done is to begin to figure out how we can do certificate-based programs that um, don't require you to come to Richmond or to Charlotte, but enable you to learn from our faculty. We have a program called Pathways, which is designed exclusively for persons in the pews who want to learn more theology, learn more Bible, learn more about church history. Um, they do this um, by, um, this was well before um, the pandemic took place. Uh, we were teaching these courses via Zoom so that um, I, um, on, um, I think it was Tuesday night for seven or eight Tuesdays, um, one um, uh, winter through into the spring, I taught, I think it was 28, 28 or 29 people the Gospel of Mark, um, and they were at all places all around the country. Uh, so I would see them on the screen. I would give them homework. They would report back with the homework and all of that, and we would learn together about the Gospel of Mark that way. Uh, more and more, theological education is poised to do that kind of teaching and training as well. And then finally, I'll say that um, one of the things that's important for theological education is to become more international. Uh, that's why we have this Global Mission Center, so that we'll bring more international students to study with us, and we send more of our students to international sites to study themselves, so that we can learn from other cultures as we think about how we can use theology to build up and nurture our own culture here. So that's a, a, a little bit of a snapshot of the kind of things that are happening in theological education around our world. And I'm trying to um, show union frame within that broader picture. But I would say I'm more and more excited about uh, um, the perspective and possibility for theological education as we move into the future because it's very different from I went to seminary in 1978 to 1981. There was one way to do it. And there were um, everybody um, in seminary, I think I was Baptist at the time, but I'd say 90 percent of the students were Presbyterian. Um, I'd say um, I'd say probably 75 percent of the students were male and most of the students were uh, from the U.S. Uh, now you go to that same seminary, um, probably um, 50 to 55 percent of the students are female. Um, many of those students are international. And as I said, only 25 percent are Presbyterian. We're becoming more ecumenical and we're becoming um, more gender balanced in our teaching. We're becoming more international in our teaching. I think that's a good thing. Union follows that model as well. And one of the things I'm excited about is the fact that we are now at the seminary with the faculty we have, with the student body we have. We represent the church we live in and in around the world. So we have students from around the world, and we have faculty from around the world, and we're trying to figure out how we can engage theology with the issues that are important in the world today. There's a little teeny snapshot, um, and it's a whole lot of data, um, but I'd be very interested in hearing if you have any questions about uh, what I've been sharing. Mm -hmm. So you'll forgive me, I, I'm a Columbia graduate. Oh, that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> There's still time, I want to say. <laughs> when I was in seminary, the, you know, the in-between class discussions, the lunch counter discussions, mm -hmm. were probably more important than what I learned in the classroom. So as things are shifting to a more hybrid model, how are those relationships going to continue to be fostered? Kind of part B to that is pastoring is a lonely job. Mm -hmm. If that networking is not being made while in seminary, how is the institution providing for that to be made when time is not being spent on campus together? 
Yeah, that's see, that's a very good question. That's the one that we fretted about a great deal at Union, um, when, um, and some of that fretting was taking place before I got to Union when the Charlotte campus was being uh, thought about because students were, at that point, the distance learning was, um, it was coming only on Saturday. So could you build community? Could you have time for the, you know, around the lunch table conversations that happened um, in a residential program and whether or not you could build that. One of the things we've, we've found, and let me start with Charlotte and then I'll go to the hybrid programs, um, with Charlotte was that um, even though students were coming only on, the, um, only on Saturdays when it first began, that they were building communities and strong sense of community amongst their fellow students. We were wondering how they were doing that and we found out that they were, and we then have now begun to nurture that, they were reaching out to each other um, using the resources that they have, which was mainly the telephone, to build networks of conversation with each other. And so what we've been able to do since then is to use tools like Zoom and um, other types of things where they actually have small group conversations and sessions that are built um, around um, technological ways of gathering. So for example, before there's um, a, 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 a hybrid or an online class that meets, um, it, the session opens up. Um, the room opens up, say, 15 to 20 minutes ahead of time. Students are in there talking and chatting, and the room stays open if they want to stay and talk with each other, whether they want the professor there or not. And then students have the option and capability of then, um, connecting, say, I want to talk with four or five of my colleagues. What, we've, what we're nurturing is that we'll provide the access with Zoom for them to be able to do that as well. So we are um, both trying to do that um, in, in a... Um, non-organized way, but then part of the curriculum is to um, have uh, the, the work that students do require that kind of outside of the classroom conversation that then builds into the discussion modules that, that are online. So um, we're trying to figure out right now how we um, can institute those um, um, cafeteria um, um, conversations online. And we found out that um, uh, in the Saturday model it worked really well. It's beginning to work okay right now as well. So how you network out of that for the long term, uh, some of the strongest networks of communities we have are the Charlotte students who met um, um, only on Saturdays for their classes, and they were in class most of the time, so they didn't have a lot of time to sit around and you know just kind of connect. Um, they came, they went to class from 8:30 to um, was it 11:30? They had chapel and lunch, and then they went to class from like 1:30 to 4, and then they were going back wherever they were going back to to go home. So they didn't have a chance to sit around and chat, and yet they still were able to build networks of community that have existed well past their graduation time. So we're conscious about it. It takes more work, but it can be done. But that, but you're, that's the great fear we in, we initially had. Um, how how are students going to network, and how are they going to have those outside of the classroom conversations? You can build that in um, uh, into the the way in which the technology operates. Uh, what can I say? Um, you probably will need to see it to believe it. Um, I just know for me personally, I'm yeah. Introvert, so I wouldn't. Yeah. I, I get caught up in a conversation when I'm with there, but I wouldn't initiate going on to something early. So that's just me personally. Yeah. And so what what we have to do for you, um, and I'm going to use as a model, not you as an individual. <laughs> what we have to do for you is to incentivize your ability, and you know how we do that, obviously. Um, we connect your performance in the classroom, or how we grade that performance, with your willingness to do this engagement. So on the one hand, there is, you know, where they're making me do it because it's a grade involved. On the other hand, we're building a relationship that otherwise online won't be built. So it's a different strategy, to be sure. Yeah, But, you know, we're also now teaching, you know, because you're talking about when you say, I know me, and I know me. Um, I'm from a generation where this is very difficult um, to work into, and I have to work some muscles to make it work. We're talking about generations of students now who are coming who have a different relationship with technology in, some, in theological schools. So for them, um, uh, I'd say 
you know, the 22 year olds more than the 77. You know, obviously, we have students from 22 to 77. The 77, we got to work really hard at this. The 22 year olds, it's not as big a deal. You're not. <laughs> you're getting a hard time. <laughs> but that's a great question. Yeah. Yes. So our cousin just started. She's 62. That's the one in New York on the hybrid model. Okay. And um, she started in September, and we email quite regularly. And she has made these amazing friendships, and is only been up to New York twice, I think. Um, but everything else has been online, and she'll get her Master of Arts from it. But she said they connect daily. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, uh, as, a, as, a, as I say, uh, faculty now are, are, are learning and being taught. I mean, faculty who, who haven't used this model before, we're providing educational experiences for them to learn how to create a classroom that can take advantage so that we can help the student like the 62-year-old 60, you're talking about who won't naturally have those capabilities built in with a relationship to technology. So we're investing a lot of energy and time to get our faculty up to speed to be able to be helpful in those regards. So that's, I mean, that kind of story you're talking about, that's not unusual to hear. Um, I've been hearing that more and more, um, both within my union seminary and other seminaries. That's right, yeah. What was the biggest group? Oh, you know, I didn't look at the biggest group. I would bet. Um, well, I did scan it, and I didn't write it down. Um, but uh, Southern Baptists had it still have a huge amount. And um, uh, what was the, the next one? Um, <coughs> Southern Baptists. I, I don't want to say because I'll, I'll say the wrong thing. But I think the biggest, the biggest group was Southern Baptists. But of course, you know, when you say Southern Baptist, you're saying a range. So, you know, a lot of people will say Southern Baptist on their material for the Association of Theological Schools, and there are different kinds of Southern Baptists. So it's not like PCUSA, where you think, okay, all the PCUSA people are kind of like in the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA. Um, so when you talk about the Southern Baptists, some are, a lot of them are in the Southern Baptist Convention, others are in other kinds of places. So that number is a little... Um, it, it's, it's, it, 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 you have to interpret that number, but that was the biggest number. Yeah. It was like 11,000 or something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, to my apologies if you mentioned this and I didn't. Oh, no, no, that's all right. So, no. so, um, so post retirement, will you continue, personally continue to have Zoom teaching? Uh, uh, yes. Oh, um, well, see, that, that will depend on. I crossed my arms, I'm getting defensive now, right? <laughs> I, 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 I want to do retirement right. Um, uh, yes, um, I, I definitely know that I will be teaching some. And uh, whether or not I teach in the Pathways program, I think probably I will because I really enjoyed that experience. Uh, so I'll probably be listed at some point in the future in Pathways. But I'll also, you know, for example, um, uh, let's say you wanted to do a course on the book of Revelation. I mentioned that from the beginning. I, would, I mean, I've done that on Zoom, actually, with churches that were distant from Richmond. I couldn't go um, all the time. So, for example, one church, um, I did, um, I think it was three or four Zoom sessions, and then the last one I went in person, and we talked um, together at a setting like this. So, yes, I'll use that. that that'll probably be one of the primary ways that I'll teach in the future. You're talking about uh, theology and pol- uh, politics. I find that very fascinating. Obviously, I think we all do. How do you? Uh, what are the tools that you can use to uh, bring people from extreme differences together, uh, other than just listening and being compassionate and you know caring for them? Yeah, yeah, a lot of prayer too. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, I probably could do, um, um, and you know that would be an interesting course actually to do theology and politics. How do they live together, and how can they um, learn from one another, and how can theology make an impact in politics? Um, uh, I w- I would say um, let me start by my own my own uh, teaching. I did a course called cultural hermeneutics um, over. I think I taught it 
um, five times at Princeton, twice at Union when I first came. And I also taught it by myself, and I taught it with a theologian. And one of the things we were doing in that course was to help students um, look at how people in different contexts, in different cultural contexts, interpreted the Bible or thought theologically. So we wanted to look at how your space, who you were, where you grew up, what kind of um, political and theological context you grew up in, how that shaped the way you thought. And the re the, so that was the first thing, to be able to identify with someone um, who thought differently than you did and then understand why they thought differently than you did from the context in which they evolved or grew up. So that would be the first step in that course in cultural hermeneutics. So we would look at, um, uh, say, um, uh, Native American theology, African American theology, feminist theology. We'd look at um, um, queer theology. We'd look at Asian theology. So we'd look at all different kinds and we try to um, uh, understand what were the components that um, shaped theological, biblical thinking out of these communities. And then one of the things we would do was... Um, uh, the, the class project uh, would be for you to um, make a presentation to the class about the way in which a community understood and worked with the biblical materials or the theological thought that was different from your own and to identify um, as though you were of that community. Whether you personally agree with it or not, you needed to be um, giving us an honest representation of how someone in that community would interpret a particular biblical text or would think about a particular theological topic. So we were trying to get you to get away from your own place and think, um, in many cases, um, in terms of communities that were very different from your own. So those, that was the first step, look at different communities and how their context shaped them, um, identify with communities different from your own, and then present their perspective as if you were defending it, um, as if it were the perspective that was most important for us to understand how God was operating in the world, and then to have conversation about why that perspective was difficult for you and how you interpret that difficulty. So that course was about trying to um, identify the issue, not solve the issue, but to identify the issue. I think that's where you start, um, um, by being able to hear and listen um, for people who are thinking dramatically different from your own, in a different place from your own. I think the, the next step would be, I think, perhaps identifying a course where we learn to talk with each other across those differences, where we learn to think together across those differences. Now, I didn't do that course. Um, that would be an interesting course to see because that's where it's hard, right? You can say, I understand, Brian. Well, I don't think that's the case. I don't think in many cases... Um, both in the church and in the political world in which we find ourselves, people who are on different sides of an issue really take the time to seriously understand what someone is understanding from a position and perspective that's different from their own and why they think that. And, you know, what's brought them to... I don't think that that is legitimately, sincerely taking place in many of these conversations. But once that happens... How do we talk across the divide that we see? How do we appreciate um, the possibility that someone can see something different from what I'm seeing? So that would be the second step. The third step would be coming to a place where we re legitimately recognize, um, no, we can't be in community because we are too different. I think that will happen in some case. I don't think that needs to happen in every case, but I think it will happen in some case. I, you know, um, uh, there, there are some folk... Um, uh, who believe things uh, that ultimately I can't be in community with um, because I can't believe that thing. Now, you know, the easy answer was that, that, that we use in theological education is Nazi Germany and, 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 and the Christianity that developed out of Nazi Germany. That's an easy answer because everybody can say, no, I can't be with the Nazis, right? But when you talk about other kinds of perspectives in our own country, that's where it's hard and challenging. But before you make that determination, I want to help create tools to think together before you come to the point where you say, well, we can't be in community together. I think too often what we start with is, I can't be in community together, let me see if I can fix it. And if you start from there, you're not going to fix it. But if you start over here, perhaps you can at least be in a place where you can be in conversation enough to at least share your thoughts and ideas and why you have them and understand the other person so that there can be a conversation. 
So that's where I am at this point. And I don't know whether um, that's enough. We're so fractured as a country today, I don't know whether that's enough. Um, but I think that's where we have to start, by listening. It's evident that we need to bring you back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, uh, I want to be cognizant of the time, but thank you mm-hmm. for this. and give you a chance to take a breath and get ready for worship. But thank you for all of this, especially that last piece. Um, that's a class we all could take, right? Um, so, uh, Sharon, we'll look to you as how long he gets to be retired before he comes back. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but thank you, and uh, thanks for being here with us this morning. So, Thank you.